Today we're going to look at a type of ion known as polyatomic ion. Polyatomic ions are a special type. When we take a look at what we've already done with regards to chemistry, we've looked at creating ionic compounds using monoatomic ions. Ions that only have a single element involved. So something like a sodium ion reacting with chloride ion to create sodium chloride. Now in this case, when we're looking at polyatomic, we're looking at several atoms that are covalently bonded together. But the thing is, with these atoms that are covalently bonded together, it's not like a normal molecular compound that's created. It's not like we take carbon, react it with oxygen, and create covalent bonds, and create carbon dioxide where we have a nice neutral compound. In this case, when the bonds get created, there's electrons that are missing. Because the electrons are missing, electrons get added to it, right? which creates an ion that has a negative charge. When we have something then that has an ionic charge, like we see with the example right here, this is an example of a polyatomic ion. This is carbonate. The carbonate ion has a carbon in it located at the center with three oxygen atoms covalently bonded to it. In order for this to work and create a stable ion, electrons have to have been added, in this case two, which is why we see the charge of two minus. Now, because this is a charged particle, it's an ion, and it can react with a metal that's positively charged and create an ionic compound. So this is now where we start to get into that bit of nomenclature that you've probably heard before, like nitrates carbonates, phosphates, you've probably heard those words before back in grade 9 science. Now we're going to look a little more detail. Another example is this one right here. This example involves nitrate. We see nitrogen at the center, three oxygens covalently bonded around it. In order for this to become a stable substance, an electron had to have been added, which is why we see this negative charge right there. This is called our nitrate ion. So we've seen a couple examples of polyatomic ions. Just remember that these are a couple different non-metal atoms covalently bonded together but have an overall charge when we create this thing. So these polyatomic ions can create an ionic bond. Now let's take a look at some more examples of some polyatomic ions. All right. In this table, this table you'll find an example like this on the back of your periodic table. This table contains some common polyatomic ions that you're going to see in the grade 10 course. When you get into grade 11 and 12, we're going to see a few extra things added into our list of common polyatomics, but for now we'll work with these ones. All right, now if you take a look, a lot of polyatomic ions have oxygen in them bonded to some other nonmetal. So if you take a look, that pretty much covers all of them except for ammonia. You'll also notice that a lot of them form negative ions, but there are occasionally ones that will form positive ions. Example being ammonium up in the top column here. Ammonium is one that creates a positive charge, right, which is why we see 
this positive charge right here, it's got one plus. So this is something that can take the place of the metal in an ionic compound because it has a positive charge, just like a metal would. The other polyatomics, the ones with the negative charges, so these guys here, all of these ones will take the place of the non-metal. So that's what they'll do when we're looking at these things. When they react to form a compound, they will become the non-metal portion. You'll notice, too, in the names, some names end in eight, like chlorate, nitrate, carbonate, sulfate, phosphate. All of those end in eight. You'll see the odd few that end in ite, so sulfite, nitrite. And then there's a couple other special cases where we see a little bit of naming happen differently. But you're going to be given this table, this information. It's just important that you recognize when a polyatomic ion is being used in a compound and what that, com what that polyatomic ion is. All right, so let's try a couple examples. All right, some examples. All right, so here's the name calcium carbonate. When I see that name, I notice, whoa, metal, and then something else. It's got carbon in it. It's probably non-metalish. But I notice I don't see carbide. So that tells me right away it's not an element from the periodic table. By seeing the 8 at the end of this, I know right away that that comes from the polyatomic. So all I need to do is find the polyatomic ion back in my chart that was carbonate. Carbonate is right here. CO3 2 minus, so that's what I'm going to use in my example. So we write our calcium ion, and as an ion, calcium has a 2 plus charge. I write my carbonate ion, which was CO3 with a 2 minus. And then we just follow the same rules as before for determining the chemical formula. We follow that sort of crisscross rule that we talked about. So our 2 is going to come down behind the carbonate. This 2 will come down behind the calcium. So I get Ca2 bracket CO3 bracket 2. But these 2s will reduce. So we get CaCO3. And that's the formula for calcium carbonate. Let's try another example. Let's try ammonium sulfate. Okay, so ammonium. We go back. And I'm like, oh, ammonium. That's not an element on the periodic table. Oh, no. What do I do? Oh, it must be polyatomic. So I look back at my list of polyatomics, and sure enough, there's ammonium. It's the very first one in the chart. It's got a plus one charge. It's formula is NH4 plus. So I go back to my example and I say, all right, ammonium is NH4 with a positive charge. Sulfate. Oh, sulfate. I hear that eight and I'm like, oh, polyatomic. Go back to my chart. Sulfate. SO4 2 minus right here. Okay. So that's what I'm going to use. SO4 2 minus. And then I do my crisscrossing and I say, okay, this 2 is going to end up behind the ammonium. So NH4. And then I need to put this in brackets because if I have two ammoniums, the 2, I don't want to put the 2 right next to the 4. If I put it there, it might look like nitrogen with 42 hydrogens, which makes no sense at all. So we put brackets around it because we want this whole polyatomic ion. We need two of them. So that's what this tells me by putting the brackets around it. Now, this ammonium had a plus one charge. I take the plus one, put it behind the sulfate, so I can just write SO4. I don't need to put it in brackets and put a one, because by writing SO4, it means it's one of them. There's my formula for ammonium sulfate. NH4 
bracket 2 SO4. Shall we try a couple given the formula and doing the name? All right, so NaHCO3. Now, if you see the formula for a polyatomic, one thing to note right away when you look at it, there'll be more than two different types of elements. Okay? That's the kicker. If you see a formula for a polyatomic, something that's got a polyatomic ion in it, it's going to have more than two elements. So I see this. I've got a sodium, a hydrogen, a carbon, and some oxygen in here. And I think to myself, oh, that's got to be a polyatomic. But I do notice right off the bat the sodium. So when I go to name this, all right, sodium, now I have to come up with what the name of this part is. So I go back to my polyatomic table and I say, hmm, HCO3. Oh, that's this one right here, which is called hydrogen carbonate, or sometimes people will use the name bicarbonate. So sodium, and then I'm going to finish the name by writing hydrogen carbonate. That's how people would name it. Or they might name it sodium bicarbonate. Okay. So that's how we can look at the polyatomic and name it. One more example. All right, I take a look at this and I say, oh, BE3PO4, and there's two PO4s. There's more than two elements present. I know it's not a normal binary ionic compound. This is something that's got a polyatomic in it. BE is found right on the PRAC table, so I name the metal beryllium. But then I've got this PO4. Well, what's PO4? Oh, yeah, it's a polyatomic. We go back. Back to our list of polyatomics, PO4 is the phosphate right here. So I'm going to use that when I go to name this beryllium phosphate. You can also have Roman numerals in this name. So if we had AU NO3. When I see that formula, I know, oh, polyatomic, because there's more than two elements in it. I know I'm dealing with gold, but gold's in the transition metal area. And I know that things in the transition metal might have multiple charges. In this case, gold could be one or three. So how do I work this out? Well, we can do our reverse crisscross. Remember that it's like there's a one written here, and there's a one written behind the nitrate. So when I cross those up back to where they started, I will get... AU with a 1 plus, I get NO3 with a negative. And I say to myself, hmm, does NO3 actually have a negative charge? Is this the actual charge of NO3? So I go back to my table and I look for NO3. Sure enough, NO3 has a negative charge. So since NO3 does have a negative charge, I know that we used gold 1 plus. So when I go to name this, I will name it gold. And then I'll put my Roman numeral in for one. And then I'll name the last piece, which is the nitrate. And that's an example of polyatomic ions. How we name them, how we write the formulas for compounds that contain them.